<clears throat> well, I'll start by asking for everyone's patience. My voice is a little off because I actually tested positive for COVID this morning. Yuck. It finally found me. Uh, anyway, I think I'll be fine. So hopefully no worries there. Um, I'm, David, you have to have more exercise and you wouldn't know about it. Thank you, Pierce. I know. I know. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to introduce Peter Sterling this morning, and, and I wouldn't miss it even if my symptoms were much worse. Um, Peter is a neuroscience and profess, neuroscientist and professor of neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of What is Health? Allostasis and Human Design. And with Simon Laughlin is the author of Principles of Neurodesign. Peter has recently turned his attention to the standard medical model of depression, as well as other forms of distress, and asked the question whether or not that model is the best way for us to move forward and help people. So take it away, Peter. And I think you have screen sharing ability. Yes. Um, thank you, David. I'm very glad to be here with you all. And I, I told David that I, I planned to talk of about 30 minutes, so there should be plenty of time for discussion. And of course, since it's recorded, you'll have all of the, you're welcome to use all of the slides and I can send the, I can send the, uh, the slides separately if you want. Uh, share my screen. Okay. Uh, share. Uh, Zoom. Uh, see yeah okay um slideshow okay uh, yeah okay so this is the title of my talk and um uh is as maybe mentioned earlier uh, right now i'm speaking to you from a small orange farm in the western mountains of uh, panama where i spend half the year so um, my laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania focused on fine scale neural circuits leading to this book, uh, ultimately with Simon Laughlin, Principles of Neural Design. And um, uh, all along while I was in my lab, I'd slip away from the lab to participate in various social movements and learn how other peoples live. And now I live half the year in this Western in Western Panama in a community of subsistence farmers and indigenous workers. So the interplay between my neuroscience and my social activism and a certain amount of uh, ethnographic experience after 20 years here really, uh, led to this book, uh, which is What is Health uh, About the Evolution of Human Design? And it asks what our species needs for a healthy life and what happens when essential needs are disturbed. Um, and so the talk draws on this book and on three recent articles um, that I have uh, uh, written this year. One is out in JAMA, Psychiatry, a new one um, recently published on, on the biology of depression and one that is uh, to appear in 2023 on how I would hope biomedicine would respond to rising U.S. death rates. So here's the, the opening part of the story is that um, U.S. death deaths of despair um, are rising sharply. Uh, in Germany, these are deaths from drug overdose, alcohol, and suicide. And this graph uh, is of men and women, um, whoops, um, uh, who were born in 1970, uh, 1970 that cohort. So they're now around uh, age 50, early 50s, the prime of life. And yet many of them rising numbers are dying from these deaths of despair. Um, and the, the rate of death um, for deaths of despair is, um, is fourfold higher for individuals who have no education beyond high school. So it's the least educated, the poorest of, uh, off, worst off uh, people. Those are the ones who are in the greatest despair. And the other thing is that these deaths are rising more steeply for the younger cohorts. This is the 1970 cohort. It crosses this line of 100 deaths per 100,000 at about age 45. But by, by uh, uh, 1980 cohort, 35, it's crossing the, the, uh, the, uh, this line, this threshold at 35. And the most youngest cohort for which there's data, uh, now age 30, they're crossing this 
uh, threshold at about um, uh, age 30. So things are bad and they're getting worse, especially for younger people who are the most, ought to be the less, most healthy. At the same time, uh, deaths, uh, for, uh, sorry, uh, the obesity is increasing. And I, I view obesity as, as eating foods to despair. This is what people do when they're feeling terrible. They stuff themselves with sweet and greasy foods. And uh, mass shootings, I, I see as murders of despair. That's, these are the people out on the, on, the, on the tail of the curve of despair, and they just really go crazy. And so I, I consider this part of the phenomenon. The National Academy of Sciences put out a, a study report uh, last year in which they claim that we don't really understand uh, despair or depression or how they connect. Um, uh, but I, I say this is complete nonsense. Despair is obviously a deep sense that one's way forward is blocked in some way and, and there's no way out, you know? And um, depression, I think, must be the massive iceberg of mental disturbance whose very tip is suicide or chronic abuse of drugs, alcohol, and, and, and food. Um, so uh, depression, as you all know, you work with this all the time, it's manifest in every aspect of our organism. It's, it affects our posture, our affect, our autonomic and endocrine regulation. Um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it affects our sleep. Um, and a cognition, but metabolism, appetite, se sexual function, everything. So um, the neuroscience and biological psychiatry widely consider uh, depression and despair behaviors as distinct brain disorders. So for example, and, and what I wanna do in this talk is to review some of the recent evidence for an alternative uh, view of this. Um, I think that despair and depression reflect a unified disturbance rising largely from our failure uh, to meet our species specific needs across the life cycle. Um, yeah. So um, the standard view that the NIMH puts out, NIDA, NIA, which is the alcohol, there's a separate uh, agency for drug abuse and for alcohol abuse, if that makes any sense. And then there are the uh, the views in the in the DSM five uh, manual, which you are all familiar with. So opioids, uh, cocaine, amphetamines are called the substance use disorder. That's what addiction is caused. Alcohol uh, addiction is called an alcohol use disorder, and suicide is termed a suicidal syndrome. Um, and major depressive disorder, so called MDD. Um, is considered uh, also a disorder, brain disorder. And there are claims from neuroimaging going back to, uh, to 1997, 25 years, um, claiming that it's localized, uh, problems of MDD are localized to the prefrontal cortex here. Um, and this is a paper that appeared in Nature. Um, this more recent uh, study um, in Nature Medicine claiming that these resting uh, neuroimaging uh, markers define four physiological types of subtypes of depression. So, um, and this, these localizations are used as a rationale to provide a technical therapy. So for example, people, this is a paper, fundamental paper that stimulated and supported the idea of implanting electrodes in this region to stimulate people and treat their, their uh, depression. By the way, um, those clinical studies had a, had a, uh, a trial, a, a blind trial, and they failed. So there's no, there's no support now for, for doing this. So the other thing that's very popular now and it's growing is a transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the idea is to point your, your magnets at this region and stimulate it and treat the depression. So I, I, it's, what one hears and reads is that MDD is just like Parkinson's. This is all just a brain disorder. So um, the question is, saying just like is, is a hypothesis. And the question is, is it true? 
So here is Parkinson's disease. It is a real brain disorder. Um, this is a substantia nigra. Uh, dopamine neurons that reside there uh, die and are lost, and it causes an extra dark uh, region in this uh, in this MRI of a single of a single brain slice. Here is another single brain which has a um, a, a PET imaging of of I-123, and it's a scan of a single brain, okay? So, um, and what it shows, these things show is that <clears throat> there's a specific and critical transmitter that is, is lost, this dopamine. And so this provides a good rationale for a drug to restore the dopamine because there's something clearly wrong here. In one brain, you can diagnose it. <clears throat> but the images purporting to localize major depressive disorder are, um, are not from an individual brain. They're composites from PET scans of about 30, 30 patients. So any signal, if there is one, must be far weaker than anything in Parkinson's disease. And so these localizations that have been sitting around here uh, and, and used to treat people uh, uh, have now been disconfirmed by several large scale studies, okay? This one study, uh, which used 49 research groups with sample sizes greater than 10,000 patients. And this is, and, and what they found was that um, functional magnetic resonance imaging did not distinguish depressed from so-called healthy groups of people. And so if you can't distinguish two groups of people, you certainly can't distinguish an individual. And this was published uh, in 2020. Uh, there was criticism saying, well, this is, this is such a diffuse study with so many different groups, who knows what, how things were defined and, and analyzed and so on. So there's a new study uh, with a, a more harmonized data set, including 1800 patients only studied with two different scanners and with the same identical analysis. So this is a much more focused study. And they found, they used 11 measures of neuroimaging plus a genetic analysis, which they uh, call a polygenic risk score. And the answer, and this is the, 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 uh, the, the paper was published in JAMA Psychiatry uh, this year. Um, so, so um, yeah, I gotta, yeah. Um, this is a, this is some data from this study. And what it shows, I'll walk you through it, is that 12 biological me measures, three, 11 uh, imaging measures and one genetic, uh, genetic measure uh, failed to distinguish the depressed group from the healthy group. And so all of these structural studies here had very small effects. This is, um, this is a partial correlations uh, and, uh, and they're all, very very small. If um, and the the overlap between the the uh, the depressed group is orange and the uh, healthy so-called healthy group is gray. They're almost completely overlapping by ninety one percent or ninety three percent. You could not sort if you sort an individual into depressed or healthy. You would be doing it essentially with the flip of a coin. So um, yeah. So. Uh, Neuroimaging doesn't, uh, I want to get, yeah, um, oops, I'm having a little, yeah. So neuroimaging fails to identify um, uh, di differences uh, in depression. And, um, and um, let's see, um, and, and so this does not, uh, support these earlier claims, which are based on small samples. <clears throat> so depression to, uh, to must be said, it is not like Parkinson's disease. It's something else, okay? Now, um, so neuroimaging um, just provides no rationale for, for, um, for deep brain simulation or for trans, transcranial ma magnetic stimulation. People may do it, but there's no neuroscience justification they can point to for this. But this study, same study, did um, uh, find two very large effects, and I want to show them to you in the next slide. This is down at the bottom. These are environmental effects, social support. People who had uh, got social support um, had uh, were 
quite well distinguished from um, from uh, de depressed from normal. Um, and children and people who had childhood maltreatment uh, very often showed up as depressed. And the overlap between these two groups is small. So this is, if you have social support, you, you have this, this is your uh, non-depressed uh, healthy group. And if you had, uh, sorry, um, this is your, yeah, this is your depressed group. And this is um, the same thing if you, you, uh, you had childhood maltreatment. So, so these are two very strong predictors of depression in the face of all of these neurological predictors and genetic predictors, which go nowhere. So, um, whoops, let's see. Yeah. So, um, so what I conclude from this is that we have to forget about these biological stuff and invest really in people's histories and um, and um, and support and th uh, this is this is um, supported by recent genetic studies. This is very new data that you may have seen, but maybe not. Okay, so these are genetic studies of major depression. Um, for about 30 years from 1980 and uh, to maybe 2010, there was a very intense search for, uh, um, for um, a Mendelian pattern of, of inheritance where there would be just a few genes um, and uh, with very large effects. And naturally during this um, search, People did find uh, and report in science and nature and so on depression genes, and they just the way they found areas for depression. And um, uh, so, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm 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 getting uh, sort of overlapped by my. Yeah, maybe I can minimize that. Yeah, okay. Um, so. In this period, the later period, people started to do genome-wise wide studies. So they they looked at very large numbers of people and they looked at their genomes in, in a great deal more detail than they could have done 30 years ago. And they also found that these so-called early discovered depression genes were also spurious and for the same reasons. Um, there, there are hundreds of genes, it turns out, associated with uh, depression mostly with very small effects. There's a few uh, genes with larger effects, but they're rare. So they don't account for most of the uh, population that, that you see, the wide prevalence of depression. So this is one of the genes, uh, the studies that came out just 2018. It was a pretty big study. So they found 44 uh, var gene variants that had uh, associated with the depression. Uh, another study, they got larger, so they found more uh, independent variants, and um, that was the next year. And um, and then most recently, there's a, a one million, more than a million individuals have been studied, and they found um, even more, 186 different gene uh, variants that were associated with depression. So. One very interesting result of this, a very important result, is that when you have a hundred <clears throat> hundreds of genes associated with major depressive area, you can also look to see well how how are they do they overlap with the other standard uh, co common diagnoses such as ADHD, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia, and they do the same genes as associated with one disorder turn up to be associated with the others, which, which sort of suggests that there's some underlying trait whose disturbance causes all these different manifestations. So um, this, uh, uh, this very interesting idea, I think re receives very important uh, support uh, in a recent uh, longitudinal study and I, I, this study I'm about to show you, I, I think is so important. I don't, maybe you're already familiar with it, but it was news to me. And it's, it's, it's a longitudinal assessment of, of, a, of a cohort of a, about a th over a thousand uh, people, men and women who were followed in, in Dunedin, uh, New Zealand 
from birth to age 45. And the, the lead authors in the study are uh, uh, Caspi and Moffat. They're at Duke, and they've they've uh, they've uh, organized these studies over you know decades. And so the first thing that they did is uh, this group that was followed over four decades. Um, their, their mental health was assessed nine times during this period. And what they found was that by age 15, 18, half of their population had been diagnosed with some, some uh, impairing disorder. By age 45, 86% of their population that they followed from birth had been diagnosed. And what the authors say is, you know, it, nearly everybody goes mad, you know, and and what this is, the cross-sectional studies that just look at prevalence miss this entirely. The other thing that they found was that by age 45, 85% of the patients who had one disorder had accumulated comorbid diagnoses. And I want to show you one example. So here's, um, here's a graph. Um, this is proportion within each sort of uh, diagnostic family. They, they divided their uh, their uh, disorders into internalizing, which was depression and anxiety, externalizing was disruption, and substance abuse, and then thought disorders, which were included delusions, hallucinations, obsessions, and so on. And what this, this, um, this point, this histogram here shows that of those people who had began with an internalizing disorder, like depression, by the, by the 45, only a small group of them had only that. The, the rest of them had also uh, thought disorders and uh, externalizing disorders. And the same thing with people who began with some externalizing thing. They had, they had only a small group had only that. The rest had accumulated more. And the people who began with thought disorders, you know, had basically uh, everything. So, um, so the conclusion is that nearly everybody goes mad. And of those, those who do go mad, nearly all have multiple manifestations. And this seems to fit with the, these genome-wide association studies because the same genes are associated with all of these different diagnoses. So again, it, it, it's looking like, this is far from a complete story, but it looks like there's some overarching trait or traits that are become intermittently disturbed, especially following childhood abuse and later trauma. So, and what I want to do is for a, um, to give a sense of uh, trait inheritance and expression, consider height, okay? This is uh, uh, Sean Bradley. He, he's he's uh, seven foot six tall. That puts him four standard deviations out from the normal, from the normal, mean of, of US height men. Now it turned out that he received his genome has been analyzed and part of the explanation for his extreme height is that he got 200 uh, um, so he doesn't have a disorder he's just out on the tail of this distribution. And so another way to put it is um, is that um, he was vulnerable to growing tall because he had all these genes if he was well fed. And so every polygenic trait um, that include many mental traits has some distribution and someone has to be out on this tail and th thus vulnerable. And so addiction, alcoholism, obesity, and depression, I don't think, I wouldn't call them diseases or disorders. They're just vulnerabilities that are waiting to be expressed under certain conditions. And that is what these genome-wide studies show, okay? And so I've heard people saying, oh, the genome-wide studies don't show anything, blah, blah, blah. They do, they show this very important thing that there's a cluster of hundreds of genes that uh, if you get too many of them, you have certain vulnerabilities. Now, um, cognitive, emotional, and spiritual traits are all polygenic. And so their extreme expression by some individuals may benefit the community, but it renders them also vulnerable. And so here's one example, okay? This is, of course, uh, Vincent van Gogh, uh, one year before he, he committed suicide. 
Now he he had a trait for you know there are many ways to express it, but I call it spirituality. And you if you read his letters to his brother from when he was a very young man, you this is the letters are full with it, and he sounds like a character out of William James. Uh, a variety of religious experience. And, and of course, this spirituality is deeply expressed, intensely expressed in his paintings. And his style was against the grain of the time. And so he was ignored and impoverished and he despaired. So the prevalence of bipolar disorder, which is the common diagnosis that he's given posthumously, uh, is about 3%. Um, so if common variants contributed to his uh, spiritual intensity, he wouldn't need to be out there far away, far for standard deviations. He'd be, he'd be somewhere in here. That's 3% or some roughly of, of the, uh, of the standard of the, uh, of the distribution. So he might not need so much to get um, as, uh, as despairing uh, as he got and, and as mad as he got. So what this implies is that most people who are nearer the mean, 86% of us go mad, we, we do so without the genetic assistance from these extra variants uh, out here that are associated with psychiatric uh, diagnoses. So, so what it means is that for most of the people you will encounter, uh, you don't mostly have to worry about their family history uh, and, and uh, you mostly you don't have to cons you mostly have to be concerned with what has happened to them um, so so that is this larger group so what I'm led to is the idea that our species design the way we evolve seems to require a certain life cycle from which uh, we can't depart very far and stay sane so I want to show you this. This is a, 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 di a, a graph prepared by a bunch of uh, really wonderful uh, anthropologists, ethnographers over many years. And it, it, it sums data from all continents of hunter-gatherer um, uh, groups. And this is age here. This is birth. And what it and this is calories, net production of calories, and it shows that at birth, uh, we, an infant is just sucking up calories all through these early years, sucking up, sucking up calories. This is age ten, um, and uh, we don't begin to provide net, take care of our own net calories until whoops, uh, about age twenty. So, what this means is that parents uh, who are raising a child like this you know, both providing them calories, but also emotional substance and so on. Um, this really, during our evolution, required two adult generations, because if there was only one adult generation to do this, just a single parent family, then the birth spacings, this would be too hard to have two children, three children close together. You would have to space the, the, the birth much farther, and we probably wouldn't sustain the species. So our species arrived because there were at least two generations plus the village to help care for these young people until about age 20. And at age 20, they, they would be admitted to the adult uh, community of hunters and gatherers, and they would begin to learn the trade. And notice that um, their product productivity from age 20 increases all the way up beyond age 45. And so what that means is that for 200,000 years, of our of our evolution, uh, since our since we emerged, we had everybody had a challenging career, okay, and it demanded prolonged study and practice. We got better at it, and that lent meaning to everybody's life, okay. Furthermore, these communities evolved under high social and economic equality. There was cooperative child care. There was free post as I've said, post-adolescent education. There was lots of free time. There was no hypertension or obesity. There was no cardiovascular or metabolic disease. I mean, it, it, this is at least in current uh, hunter-gatherer societies, this is true. And there was no addiction and very little, uh, relatively little suicide. So in the US, we depart from this uh, seriously. And so for example, uh, for childcare, we started out uh, you know, 200 years ago,
ago, with 100 years ago, with two generations. We went after World War um, II to a single parent, parent nuclear family generation. And now we're back to uh, half a generation, a single parent trying to raise a child or more, a more child. And, and then we also have this fraught transition to adulthood. So if at age 20, you, if you manage to get a job, it's often, if you don't have further education, it's, it's something you learn in a few minutes or days. And, uh, and there isn't a challenging career and there's very little free time. And so I wanna show you one example, two examples here. Here is the, here's the rise of single parenthood. This is uh, from 1968 till recently. And this is single, the growth of single parent households. And it's gone from a few five, 6% up to a quarter of all households raising children are single parents. And um, it's, it goes exactly parallel to these rising uh, deaths of despair. The other thing is that US is the only country uh, among you know, uh, relatively rich developed countries for which there is no paid vacation. So uh, you have a miserable job, it's fully paid and you never get any paid time off. Uh, notice that the uh, the train, the uh, the railroad wor uh, workers are are asking for sick, paid six days sick leave off. You know, my gosh, this was one. This is a battle that was won two generations ago. And we're still fighting it. So um, I uh, more there's more detail in this in a, in, in this uh, article I published in in JAMA Psychiatry earlier in the year with Michael Platt, um, and I want to end the, the, the presentation with a comment by uh, Daniel Geshwind, who's at UCLA, who's a fantastic uh, scientist. And here's what he says of these G GWA studies, which he, he's a leader in. He says, what we call psychiatric diseases are just levels of impairment. The threshold is not scientific, but clinical, practical threshold for when individuals are unable to function in the world. And his last line is this. He says, these syndromic diagnoses are just one end of a continuum of normal variability. And that is the case I've been trying to make to you. So to conclude, mental disturbance across the lifetime is extremely common. Most people who experience one type of disturbance eventually experience others, sometimes simultaneously. Neither imaging nor genetics can distinguish a disturbed population from a healthy one. And that means certainly they can't distinguish individuals. Mental pay traits are polygenic. So inevitably, some people are gonna lie some distance from the mean. But such people often provide some key social ro role, such as art or music or healing. I mean, imagine uh, the world without, without uh, Vincent van Gogh. So the strongest predictors of disturbance are childhood trauma and life stress. There's no, there's no evidence of imbalanced or ne deficient neural transmitters. That is a, a story that has just died away. And although it's still being repeated. So because of these things, there is zero scientific rationale to treat the brain with electrical or magnetic stimulation, or really with drugs. There's no reason, there's no argument that you can make from neuroscience for this. So what to do? Well, I think we need to clearly improve childhoods. We need to strengthen families. Uh, we need to improve early childhood education to identify each child's innate talents and provide them with chances to practice. And later, we, we need to provide advanced training for, media, for, to, for 20 year olds to find uh, meaningful adult activities. And for disturbance, I, I think what we have to do is reassure people that you're not alone, <laughs> people recover, and, and to try to support their efforts to, to, uh, to find some peace. So there's really, you know, nothing to it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So, if you uh, if you stop screen sharing, I'll see more people who might have questions. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I may want to do it again because I have a few more slides, but I'll I'll, I'll do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you first, and it 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 kind of goes off of some of the things in your conclusions. Um. We actually named this presentation after that recent paper you did. Yeah. Neuroscientist evaluates the, yeah. the standard model of depression. And 
in the opening, you talk about having family and friends who are on various forms of medication. Right. I wonder, this is more personal and less scientific, but I wonder how it is for you to talk to people who either find some relief in that or are just desperate to find some sort of relief somewhere and so want to try that or kind of on the other end of the line, they've tried to come off of them, but fallen into a really, really deep depression or had a hard time. How, yeah. How is that for you? Um, well, um, I handle it by mostly with my family by keeping my mouth shut. They know my views on everything. My son, 20 years ago, when I he's now 50 something. And when I try to tell him something in his early 20s, he said, Dad, I your voice is in my head. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't need it. So since then, I, I try to keep my mouth shut. Uh, and they, uh, but they just somewhat discount me. So they surreptitiously have either taken antidepressants themselves or fed them to their my grandchildren. And, um, uh, and now, I think some several of them want to get off and it's not that easy. Uh, so uh, I recommend, the, uh, you know, this stepped, stepped care. It's, it's a really tricky thing to do. And I'm just sympathetic uh, with them. Uh, but they, you know, they know my views and I, I can't, you know, uh, I'm very sympathetic. And that's what I try to offer is sympathy and support. Yeah, that sounds more than reasonable. Um, Pepper, go ahead. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, stimulating and it's, it's so refreshingly different. I mean, I'm in, I was with UCSF for 35 years and um, two thoughts and sort of questions. One is the movement around social prescribing. So bigger in Europe, but they're actually having physicians, family physicians, write a prescription, go take a walk with this group, go bowling with this group, uh, go move to a farm in Panama with this group. Um, I, I see you nodding. That, so that's one. And, you know, it's, but it is gaining traction, um, which I think is great. Um, and the other is, uh, what is your sense of the role of psychedelics? Because I think people do get stuck in this paradigm with this history of trauma, with this early kind of groove stuck in their head around the way they address the world or the way they see the world. And, you know, we're seeing a resurgence, um, you know, with ketamine and, um, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, ayahuasca, Central America, what your thoughts are about this? Yeah, those are, those are good questions. Uh, thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, I would distinguish, um, you know, ayahuasca, there are people here who do ayahuasca, there are communities, there are ayahuasca communities, and they use it as part of the social, uh, right. social reconstruction. And I think it, you know, uh, I think the social part is more important than the drug. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah. so, um, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was in a men's group when I was in my 30s and early 40s in Philadelphia, um, and I'm, as I was thinking about it now, we were all we were all disturbed. I mean, that's what we got, we got together to talk about every week, and and uh, and it was very very helpful, you know. During your social contact is very important. The, uh, I think that Michael Pollan um, wrote a couple of wonderful books on, um, on food and so on, but I think his thing about uh, psychedelics is uh, an atrocity, really. Uh, it's a very misleading thing. If somebody tells me uh, my life was changed by a psychedelic, God bless you. I mean, that's fine. I'm not going to argue with that. But this is not a this is not a route to improving public health. This is this is total uh, misleading, and it's and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. As to ketamine, ketamine is a drug with tremendous uh, potential for abuse. I mean, it's a party drug. It it is not going to treat people with depression. It might cheer you up for a day or two, a week or two, a month. I don't know what, but it's going to leave a lot of people having a lot of trouble with, with that drug. And uh, I think this is a, a major, uh, and again, I would call it a, it, an atrocity of a starting, starting a problem that you can see is going to be a public health problem 
and and just ignoring it. This is ketamine is not going to help people. It's a it's a it's a binds to uh, glutamate receptors that are all over the brain. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. And there is no rationale. These are just oh well, let's try ketamine. It'll cheer us up very quickly. Uh, th there's no argument of anything that is disturbed. There's no transmitter that's disturbed. There's no receptor that's disturbed. There's no image that's disturbed. This is just some bullshit that they're now charging a tremendous amount of money for. They're renaming esketamine because they can get a patent on it. This is this is terrible. Right, right. I, I get that part. I, I, what I'm hearing <clears throat> is that there may be a lot of benefit from the groups or the connection. Um, you know, I'm a little biased. My wife is a ketamine therapist. And, you know, that there's, there is some literature around uh, the changes, but I'm hearing you and I would agree that a lot of it is the connection. Um, and I do wonder about the ability to unloosen some of those deep childhood traumas that, as you point out, are a part and probably very hard to mention. But great answers. Thank you very much. And thank you. for the yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pablo. You know, Thanks, you, know, you, know, you know, I would just say one thing that helped me when I was in the midst of my depression in, uh, you know, uh, in my early 40s, was somebody pointed me actually to the Old Testament. And I spent a summer reading, uh, I was as down as I could be, but reading from chapter one, and every story that I encountered, Abraham and Isaac, uh, uh, Jacob wrestling the angel, these I realized were my story they were my personal story and um so that's the way i see i'm an atheist but i see those stories that are thousands of years old as very very relevant and maybe you'll find somebody uh who would uh, respond to those mm -hmm. great <coughs> lehman jump in there well oh, thanks very much uh, i really appreciated your talk I, I should say that i'm um just visiting this group i've given grand round lectures before uh, I'm actually a philosopher by training, and I work for a law firm that is mainly suing pharmaceutical companies for ineffective and dangerous harmful uh, drugs, but also uh, ECT therapy. So we have a lot of these cases where we have pe people who have been seriously harmed by e ECT, uh, and, and so I found, found your talk to be very much relevant uh, to to the sort of theoretical foundations, or the or per, perhaps the the uh, the falsehood of those theoretical foundations. Nonetheless, I have uh, a couple of questions. I'm very much struck by your conclusion that there's zero scientific rationale to treat the brain with electrical magnetic stimulation or drugs. So, what would you say in the case of people who have have, have um, reported? Uh, dramatic success with ECT therapy. It's, you know, it's the thing that saved my life. Or similarly, people who have taken SSRI antidepressants on the basis of a chemical imbalance in the brain who have equally reported, you know, dramatic and unmistakable positive results. People get relief from all kinds of different things, you know, uh, from banging their head against the wall and stopping. I mean, uh, there are many, many things. I, uh, uh, I started talking about ECT. I testified in 1976 to the New York State uh, hearings about ECT because um, I read an article by, uh, by Burton Roche in the New Yorker called Empty as Eve about a woman who'd been very a brilliant economist and had lost her memory. So some people completely lose their memory. Other people, you know, have other less difficulties, and so other people say it saved my life. the The reason we have long term studies uh, with controls is to find out what is the difference between this. I mean, the, these these depression studies, the the DBS, the deep brain stimulation that that was done by. Um, these people, um, what's her name? Um, she's become very famous for doing these deep brain stimulation, and Helen Helen Mayberg, okay, and uh, people swear by her. And there was an article in the Atlantic, which is very revealing, that uh, wh wh when they did a double blind study of her of her stuff, stuff they didn't support it. They stopped the 
the company that was supporting making her equipment stopped this in the middle because it wasn't doing any good. And she said, oh, my patients, I take care of my patients. And I went, well, she, she does. She was taking good care of her patients, but it wasn't the electrical um, stimuli that had anything to do with it. So, so to answer your question, people say all kinds of things. You need these studies. And, and the, the imaging studies, I think, and the gen genetic studies are very, very convincing that there is not, there's no here here. Now, if you, if you wanna say um, we should put an electrode deep in the frontal lobe, even, even without any real idea of what we're doing, I mean, why would, why would an electrode there improve your mood or your, your ability to think? It, does, it doesn't make any sense. So, uh, so I think that we can just discount these things as, as without intellectual rationale. Then if you wanna say, well, maybe, maybe we can do some little tweak that we make up or a drug company makes up to make things better. Well, you know, I, 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 that's where I cash in my chips. I, I don't have anything to say about it, but it doesn't make any sense. Thanks very much. Did you have a follow-up to that, Lehman, or another question? Um, well, I was just going to ask whether or not you were familiar with the fairly recent uh, paper that was published by Joanna Moncrief and, and colleagues is debunking the whole chemical imbalance theory. I mean, yeah. I've actually been involved in this. I published on it back in 2008. And, um, you know, it's the sort of thing that sort of comes into fashion and goes out of fashion again and again. People take it up. But, um, you know, once again, there's this whole sort of marketing line that's been sold uh, and, and, you know, and even doctors yeah. have sort of, you know, parroted this uh, as a way of get, getting people on SSRI antidepressants. And it, here's, here's one area where I think, you know, it's very much consonant with what you're saying, that if you actually look at the evidence in the clinical trials, uh, there's it's just a slim, very slim margin in some cases where the, the SSRI beats placebo, but on the whole, there doesn't seem to be any scientific evidence. That's that's right. No, I'm familiar with that. In fact, I was going to, I was waiting for somebody to ask about that. I was going to show that uh, her paper I cited in my, in my uh, article that, that David has. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a very uh, important and, in, and I think influ influential article. Um, and there's two other articles that go with it, one of which uh, came out, I think, in 2021, um, which I also cite at the end of this, uh, uh, my talk, which is, uh, and I'll leave in the extra slides in my talk, so they have these references. And that is uh, going back um, to uh, the uh, all of the FDA studies and showing that there's about 15% of the, any population that really does, for one reason or another, respond to the SSRIs. And the rest of them, the 85%, really don't do very much better, different from a placebo. And so those, to, to fix up these 15%, you're exposing the rest of them, everybody, who's already disturbed to all this this shit, basically, you know, that really mucks with, messes with their brain to no to no good effect. Thanks, Peter, I've got a, I'm going to read a question in the chat that, that is kind of in this same area. Do you think there is a mechanism or a physiological effect for medications like SSRIs outside of the placebo effect for place for patients that feel better on them? And one thing that brings up for me is I'll just add to the question, I guess, is a lot of these studies that you guys are referencing, they're four to six weeks, six to eight weeks. And I can think of a lot of drugs that would make my life better for four to six weeks, but not very long after that, and things might fall, start falling apart after that. So. so the question is, do is I there, think there's anything? Is, is there something when someone starts taking SSRIs, for instance, or Adderall, is there some effect in there that's like, wow, I feel better? Well, yeah. I mean, I've taken, I used to take, my, my dad was addicted to uh, Dexedrine. And so when I had to drive from New York to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, it was a 10 hour drive. I'd, I'd, I'd catch a half a Dexedrine from him and I'd take it. 
wow, that was fantastic for the drive. I mean, I could, I was alert. I could, but I, I was at a meeting last May, which is sponsored by some a military guy who's in the army, and and his business was trying to find stuff that would make people better at fighting. And one of the things he said at this meeting was, they used to recommend uh, dexedrine, you know, and amphetamines for their soldiers to keep them alert and make them better. That's what you get in Ad Adderall, basically. And he says they stopped doing it because they found it, they were more awake, but their judgment was impaired. So, so after, you know, 60 years or something, the, the, uh, the US military no longer uh, hands this stuff out. I mean, any short term thing might give you a lift, of course, you know, that's what we take. I, I like my five o'clock cocktail, you know, but uh, you can't, these things are extremely complex. I mean, the SSRIs affect serotonin. There's 17 serotonin receptors, there are variants, there's paroxetine that it affects dopamine, it affects acetylcholine. I mean, uh, these things, we have no idea of a neuroscience of, of what's really going on. You, you, you call it an an SSRI, but it's doing dozens of other things that, that we can't evaluate. No, I don't think there's any any place for any rationale for these things. If you do it, you know, people will do it because they're sold, but I, I don't think there's any scientific rationale for this. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> there's another question from the chat, kind of going in a, in a slightly different direction. Somebody had mentioned social prescribing before like hey let me write you up a thing to take three big walks this week and stuff like that and this is from somebody that i know who's actually a doctor and she says social prescribing makes me nervous given our often given it, uh, the disconnect between the realities of lives of the families we serve and the lack of resources or the allocation of resources i wonder if you want to comment on that and it, it takes me back to something i've read in your papers about how when streets are cleaned up or when public parks are made to be really nice, that, that would be a better overall prescription for an entire neighborhood in a way. Well, you know, there is no one single thing. I, I think what I take cause of despair and the cause of depression massively is that we have lost a whole variety of things that we evolved to need. And that includes um, help with child child rearing. You know, one parent cannot simply cannot do it. Really, I mean, maybe one does, and there's one example. But but we we know that the 25 percent who are doing it are are failing, and they're many times they're addicts, and they're abusing their children, and their and their boyfriends are abusing the the young girls growing up, and there's a tremendous level of abuse, and so we have to get to that. We have to have people have some access to nature. Sure, you want to clean up the neighborhoods. People need exercise. You know, um, I had a, a friend who's who's psychiatrist. He had a bad heart, and a psychiatrist would meet him and take him for a walk. I mean, it, those were the good old days. <laughs> um, so no, I mean, I think there, there's no single answer. We need many, many, many things. We the U.S. right now has just deteriorated so far that uh, far farther than any, you know, of the other rich, rich countries that we need, you know, many things to, uh, to repair. Looks like there's some people David, in the chat. David, yeah. David you're, you're muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Hey, Pierce, you've got a hand up. And then I'll read a couple questions from the chat. Yeah, uh, it, may, it may not be necessary to do so, but I would like to remind everybody of the first presentation we had of the year by Dr. Haas, whose prescription was for people to go to the woods to take a walk. And that makes much more sense, really, particularly in light of what Dr. Sterling is talking about. And of course, there's plenty of firm evidence that shows that getting exercise does indeed decrease depression. 
So uh, if you want to think about prescribing, that might be where your best choice would be. Yeah, you know, I mean, maybe you could meet a patient if you have an hour with a patient, meet him in the woods, you know, meet him in the park, you know, <laughs> take a walk. Good for you both. That question about antipsychotics was um was prefaced with, I was told psychosis is toxic to the brain. So like a psychotic episode is toxic to the brain. I've heard that too. Um, and stopping the psychosis is important to healing. And the, and, the, and the way to stop psychosis in this framing is take Halperidol or, or whatever. Uh, you know, sorry, I've been following this since the middle 70s. And um, the claim that psychosis is toxic to the brain, there's no foundation for that. Um, the, the actually, the people who are up at the Broad Institute studying uh, schizophrenia and the molecular basis of it, show one of those guys gave a talk, a big talk I was at, he's, and he shows this um, slide of cortical spines degenerating in schizophrenia. I looked up, I spent a month looking up the data on that, and it's totally wrong. It's totally crap stuff from the 80s. And I wrote him a letter about this, and I pointed out to another neuroscientist that these, these things that they are quoting, and Eric Kandel, you know, is a great scientist, Nobel Prize winner, I respect a great deal, publishes the same thing in his book. He shows these degenerating spines. It's, it's wrong. It's bullshit. It's, it's just not true. There's no evidence that psychosis causes brain damage. Okay. Now, there's plenty of evidence that hal haloperidol and thorazine do cause brain damage. That's what causes tardive dyskinesia, uh, which is, a, you know, as you guys probably see it, uh, is a grotesque, you know, uh, motor disorder that doesn't go away when you stop taking the drug. So, uh, and we know that ECT uh, given for psychosis does brain damage over a long run. One shock might cause somebody to lose their memory. Might one shock or 10 shocks may not cause damage to other people, but, but they relapse. And so they end up getting hundreds of shocks over long periods of times. And, and it does cause brain damage. And there's plenty of evidence for this. Peter, someone asked in the chat, um, and I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but they're going into how, like, I guess it's the idea that maybe SSRIs, for instance, could be helpful if we, <clears throat> if we knew all kinds of, <clears throat> if we knew all kinds of details about the person's life, about their genetics, about their dopamine and serotonin levels, in some ways it gets to what you were writing about um, in that other paper, how should biomedicine respond? And it's that idea of like, <clears throat> should we just find out more and more details so that we can really get down to the gene? Or should we fund public housing better and build more basketball courts? I'm super paraphrasing your work too. Uh, I'm saying we have no evidence of all of these genetic studies. There is no evidence that genes are the problem that we are facing. There's no evidence that transmitters are the problem that we are facing, which is that 86% of people go mad. And uh, th there's plenty of evidence that, um, that the disrupted social lives that we, we have in this country uh, are a problem. We need to have people have vacations. We need to have them have help with childcare. We need to have their children have decent uh, elementary educations. You know, all of these things are, will help many, many, many people get better. You know, uh, the individual person uh, is is a tough. You're confronted with somebody, and you do your best. But they, what they mostly need, is somebody who understands them, listens to them, gives them support, believes in them, and so on. And if you just dole them out a bunch of pills. I think you're doing damage. Everyone, just a <clears throat> further encouragement to uh, get on camera if you want to ask a question and raise your physical hand or raise your virtual hand if you know how to do that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to keep it open to other folks right now, Peter, and not be selfish with you and just ask all my own questions. Sure, sure. 
Um, oh, Anne, go ahead. And then Lori after that. Real different kind of question. It's so intriguing to know that you've chosen to spend long periods of time every year absented from the United States. And I wonder what you could say about how that's contributed to your perspective and to your own well-being. Well, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, it means that for these six months that I would normally be in a very dark, cold place, I can go outside, you know, at breakfast and watch birds on my terrace. Then I can take a, a walk up in the mountains where I see my neighbors growing crops and I can talk with them. And um, uh, it's it's a uh, and the life outside of my I've lived in my laboratory for. 40 years, I looked out of the same window <laughs> every day. And now I, you know, I can have other experiences. I can, when I'm done writing, I can prune my orange trees, you know? And uh, I guess my, my way of putting it would be, I, I, when I grew, was young, I, I, I read Karl Marx, I was, a, I was a leftist. And Marx said, he says in the Communist Manifesto actually, 1848, he says, when we achieve communism, that is when everybody has, you know, uh, uh, when we can give his his line actually uh, in in the Communist Manifesto is to each according from to each according to his need from each according to their ability, and I actually think that is a very good. Uh, moral standard, uh, a, a very good way of thinking about what we need uh, in, in the world and in this country. So, but the other thing he said was, when we have achieved this state, you know, this happy state, um, uh, I will hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, and I will write criticism in the evening. And uh, to me, uh, this was a beautiful uh, idea of of an integrated life, and uh, it's I've had the luck to actually to to do a little bit of this. You know, yeah. I I hasten to point out that when I got my cataracts uh, replaced with the plastic lenses, I was very glad to have uh, an eye surgeon who does it all day every day. You know, I mean, there's a space for specialization. So, quick follow up question, okay? I'm wondering whether you think that the increasing diversity of this country and increasing world travel, especially among young people, might help to fractalize our our locked up problems. Well, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's a that's that would be one optimistic possibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I always felt that the Peace Corps, which I initially thought was an imperialist plot has turned out to produce a lot of generations of younger people who actually have seen the world and see how other people live. And they often uh, help uh, in, in enhance our, our understanding. Yeah, no, I think travel for young people uh, has to be uh, eye-opening, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. Oh, Lori, Lori, if you want to unmute, you're, go for it. You're muted, yeah. <clears throat> Lori, if you press the space bar on your computer, that'll unmute you. You just have to hold it down while you do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. I think. Got it. Thank you very much for this incredibly interesting talk and your report on the research and the way that you integrate it. It's very helpful, I appreciate it. My question is about, and I, I know this is, well, my question is about people who are schizophrenic, who do, can function on the antipsychotic mm -hmm. medications, often don't like the effects, go off the medications and become very disorganized can't function, often become homeless, <clears throat> living on the streets. Um, what do you think about that medical treatment for people who are schizophrenic? Well, you know, let me uh, say that, I, I mean, I, I have some views, but I don't, 
I'm not in charge of taking care of everybody. So, uh, you know, I'm, I take it with some humility, but I have had a number of friends who have committed suicide. I have a number of friends who have been uh, diagnosed with bipolar or schizophrenic disorders. And sometimes I have one friend who was di you know, diagnosed with everything. And um, I would say that the experience of people I know is that, you know, taking them gets them stuck in where they are. So you may function at some very low level with this stuff, but then you gain a lot of weight and you can't think straight and, and so on. So uh, I think it, it's a mixed bag. I, I can't tell everybody exactly what to do with, I have one friend that was her, her daughter, you know, in her late twenties or something, is on a lot of antipsychotics. I, I'm, I'm not going to tell her not to do that. But there are people who make their careers uh, in psychiatry and psychotherapy of dealing with, you know, the really, um, the really uh, um, impaired people, right. and right. Um, and many manage to do that without, you know, without antipsychotic drugs. I mean, these are really toxic, uh, toxic drugs, and so. You know, uh, if if you tell me you have to do it, and your daughter has to have it, I I can't say it, but I don't. Doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you very much, again for your whole. Sure. Well, thank you all for actually. I appreciate your your interest and your and you're taking care of people, which I, I I'm not doing that much. You know. <laughs> yes, Miriam. Unmute, unmute. I need to unmute to tell people oh, to yeah. unmute. I see. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. I also found it really, really, really interesting. And I, I just one comment, which is like, it reminds me of when I, I'm an MD and not a psychiatrist, but way back when I started college, I remember studying Thomas Saz, of yes. course, <laughs> you know, yes. and it, yes. some of what you say reminds me a little bit. Yes. And um, yes. so that's one comment. And then um, a question, because um, I also started traveling, which sort of saved me when I was very, very young. And I did see a little bit different attitude in smaller communities toward people who acted different, differently mentally. And I'm just wondering if in, in your area and in your experience in Panama, if you've seen some folks who act differently and are not referred to professionals, but are, you know, sort of taken care of by the community or tolerated and yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In this community, it's a small community. Um, there are no homeless people. Um, there are, and if somebody is not doing well, somebody, some member of the family, there, there's a great deal of uh, familiar, like there's four founding families in this community. Somebody takes them in. We went to visit some guy who was, uh, he was almost blind. He was living on his own. His, 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 uh, his uh, niece brought him some food and my wife went to visit him because we were, she was a member of this called Buenos Vecinos, Good Neighbors, taking people some food. And she said, well, have you got everything you need? And he said, well, I, yeah, I'm pretty happy here, you know, um, but I get a little cold, a little chilly at night. So she looks at me and I have this uh, polypropylene uh, sweater on and so she <laughs> she takes it off so she she gave him the shirt off my back you know <laughs> i mean people people do that here and uh yeah people uh there, there's no police here uh out, occasionally somebody in a will get a drunk on a saturday night and and there'll be a stabbing or something and then for a few days there's a police but basically very little um, sometimes there's a local guy uh, I've picked up in the street after a binge and thrown him in a pickup truck uh, and taken him home. But um, there's not uh, the sort of thing that you see in the streets of Los Angeles or Berkeley or any place like that. People are taken care of, you know, and, and there's there are no crack vials. I mean, there's, there, you know, there's a bit of alcohol, but there's, there's not a big drug presence. No, it's people have lives, you know, they have lives. Yeah. Carl, unmute yourself, Carl. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, this is great. So 
Um, I'm not quite sure how to get into this, so but your examples a moment ago are uh, really point to the ways in which we culturally have this process of othering people who are different. Uh, that's sort of the best word I can. Right. That's right. Up. That's right. And that's that right. process of othering occurs. Uh, so um, I have a son who's uh, autistic. Um, the uh, system here will be such that he will probably never work, though he has, he's pretty smart, um, but he'll be different. And if he worked somewhere, he, he needs to have an environment that kind of puts up with his differentness. Right. It's going to be hard to find. And the, um, it brings up the example of that seven foot four guy who right. young fellow who you had there. And, um, and uh, so he's someone who's different, but people want him. At least they want him as center on their team. Right. And um, but we know that the folks who we work with and some of our kids, they're not wanted. They end up on the street. Right. And that that kind of switch, which you suggested that Marx was interested in, though Marx was not interested in personal psychology. He was very interested in how the sociology of the moment helps to create people in that sense. And that was where you began with the issue about uh, childhood and child development. How do we um, create a world in which uh, this othering process is turned around so that we know that there are truly multiple intelligences and we don't know about the beauty that people who are different bring to us, much like Van Gogh, who was unknown until finally he broke through after he died because of Theo's brother. Right, right. I mean, my only answer really is you have to keep at it. You know what to do, I know what to do. There's there's uh, 62 people here who I think, uh, from what I can gather, know what to do, and you do it a lot. You just have to keep doing it. You know, it's uh, we have to get the climate back. We have to get, you know, people have to have their lives back. You know, and uh, this is a very potent thing. I mean, the steam engine this started with the steam engine and and you know uh, and manufacturing, and it. Took, over, took us over, but it's only 200 years, 250 years or something out of 200,000. And, um, and, it, and it had many positive effects, as we all know. I mean, I wouldn't be speaking to you without this technology, but it's taken over and we have to find ways to, to get it back. And uh, I'm, I'm old, I can't, I, I can just hand the baton, you know, I can't, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm about at the end of my uh, ability to, uh, I mean, I sent off this, I wrote three articles this year and I've included them here and that's about all I can, I can do. I can see what has to happen, but I, you know, you, the young people have to take it now and run with it, you know. Lori, go ahead and unmute. Me. Hi, thank you again for this continued terrific conversation. I heard about an institute, I forget where it's based, but that evaluates the level of happiness in each country <clears throat> or most countries around the planet. And often the Scandinavian countries are at the top of the list. The most recent one I heard about, Sweden was number one. And one of the examples as you said, Dr. Sterling, about people ha have to have a life. When a child is born in Sweden, the couple get 52 weeks of paid vacation that they can share 
for the next eight, they can keep it, they can save it for the next eight years. I mean, in addition to paid child care, universal health care. So there, and, and enough housing. So there, there are practical, specific things we can do as a society to, to really raise the level of social support and decrease the depression and despair that you've talked about so clearly and eloquently. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Scandinavian countries do a lot and uh, they are a very good model. I mean, not every detail, but uh, they're a very good model. I would say <clears throat> there's a guy, uh, Peter Gray. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He writes about childhood education and he has a TED talk, Peter Gray, look him up. He's very articulate. And <clears throat> he points out that, you know, children as we evolved mainly educated each other. And the age structures in, in early small communities were, were a, a rich age structures. It wasn't just, you weren't out of a class of everybody the same age. And so they taught, the older kids taught the younger kids. The older kids discovered if they played soccer with them and they beat them up, then they didn't have enough for a team. So they learned how to cooperate. They didn't have referees. So they learned how to regulate themselves socially. There's so much wrong with current child education Right. Uh, childhood education that is uh, easily fixable with just some resources and by paying teachers and hiring teachers of the highest uh, quality and, and making this into a mission. I mean, this is this is a complete uh, no brainer and it's completely ignored in terms of public education. The main thing in, in, in Gray's uh, view is allow people to find kids to find what they're actually good at instead of telling them to sit still. I mean, my God. <laughs> and I would say on our farm, on our farm, it's a small farm, but we have a, an indigenous family, uh, which uh, we, we've now been here long enough so that the child that was born the year we came is now into his last year in high school. Wow. And the children, the children that we thought we were gonna grow up and leave I haven't left. <laughs> they bring their they bring their wives and their and they have more children. So we have a lot of grandchildren on the farm now. And um, what's clear is that there is an age structure. They'll all play soccer. We have a little. They have rigged up a little soccer field, and the, the thirty year olds are playing with the six year olds. And um, and which is um, great. And, and there's a kid. One of the kids. Uh, he's probably about five. Um, uh, and Alec, he, as we drive by, he's out there raving his hands to us and talking to us. And he's clearly, um, he would be diagnosed ADHD. Just no question about it. His grandfather sometimes pick, and he's, he's into everything. His grandfather picks him up, um, grabs, holds his hand, just quietly, you know, calms him down. And the whole family is well aware of his uh, behavior but it's, he's just part of the family, you know? And uh, when he goes to school, <laughs> you know, he's gonna have a problem. Mm -hmm. But it isn't necessary that people should have those problems. They just have to make school about the kid finding, finding what he can do, because that's what gives you dopamine. You practice what you can do, you get better at it, you get your dopamine. You don't need Adderall to, to raise your dopamine. Because that's what Adderall is doing. It's, it's, it's the stimulant that's causing release of dopamine in your nucleus accumbens. We, don't, we shouldn't be doing that. Right. And the long-term studies on Adderall don't support it. That nobody, 30 years later, nobody's better. The, the studies I would still like to maybe publish on, the long-term studies don't show any positive effects of the ADHD drugs. What they show is the same effects and people are one inch shorter because it stunts their growth over a long time. Mm. Mm. Peter, you, you continue to remind me that it's possible that we could bend society more toward what we need as a species. Right. Which for a long time, what I was hearing from folks that that was just kind of nuts. Life is the way it is. You gotta take whatever pills you need to take or do whatever behavioral program you need to do to get these kids straight or whatever. It's, it's weird that the idea that we would make society something our species could live in was 
kind of pie in the sky. So thanks. That's my way of saying <laughs> thanks. And I'm seeing a lot of yeah. thanks and appreciation in the chat too. Right. Well, I'm uh, very grateful for you all putting up with me for all this time. And uh, it's a you know very satisfying to me. And the thing about pie in the sky is th these other drugs and just doing life as usual, it isn't working. That's the problem. It's it's right. a it's a disaster, and now people are needing to pay attention to this, you know. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll let you all go, <laughs> as they Peter. say on NPR. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Peter. Much appreciated. Have a good holiday. I hope you. I hope your COVID is uh, a happy one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let me know. Yeah. Will do. Well, good luck. Have a good holiday, everybody. Get some rest. Take a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and look forward to seeing you all in the new year. Oh, and the, the 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 thing for CEUs where you can click on is still in the chat box if you haven't yet. <laughs>